difficult. You've got to find what you love, and that is as true for work as it is for your lovers. Your work is going to fill a large part of your life, and the only way to be truly satisfied is to do what you believe is great work. And the only way to do great work is to love what you do. If you haven't found it yet, keep looking and don't settle. As with all matters of the heart, you'll know when you find it. And like any great relationship, it just gets better and better as the years roll on. So keep looking, don't settle. This is Steve Jobs speaking to students graduating from Stanford University in 2005. It's hard not to be inspired. In his talk, he tells a compelling story of following various passions, including learning calligraphy. And the end result? Apple and Pixar, companies that are worth trillions and billions of dollars respectively. But is his advice to follow your heart, to follow your passion, good advice? Welcome to LSEIQ, the podcast where we ask social scientists and other experts to answer one intelligent question. I'm Sue Windybank from the IQ team, where we work with academics to bring you their latest research and ideas. In this episode, I ask, should you follow your passion? We'll learn how following a calling turned one LSE graduate to beer and building a successful social enterprise via a holy revelation. We'll hear stories of animal hoarding, passions gone wrong and burnout. And there's some hopeful news for those of us who just haven't found our passion yet. It's widespread on social media and in popular culture, but where has this idea of following your passion come from? I spoke to Sally Maitlis, Professor of Organisational Behaviour at the Said Business School at the University of Oxford. I have this impression um, that the narrative of following your passion has become much more prevalent in society over the last decade or so. Do you, do you think that's fair and where do you think that's come from? Yes, I, I think it's fair. I, I agree with you that it seems to be something we, we hear everywhere. In fact, it's very easy to feel bad if you're not following your passion. You sort of feel there's something wrong with you and you should be following your passion because everybody is telling you to follow your passion and you sort of believe everybody else is following their passion. So I think it's um, it's a nice it's a nice idea, but it can become oppressive. But it hasn't always been around. And, and in fact, um, you know, historically, really going back in time, uh, we couldn't even, people couldn't even follow their passion because they simply did the work that they were born into. And I think it was in... Um, you know, more maybe in the 60s when people were generally, you know, sort of living well and thinking about how do I want to live. I think maybe what you're referring to is a really a, quite a recent a sort of revival of that that we often associate with, with the millennials who want meaning in their work, want purpose, want a good life and expect to really sort of love what they do. And if they don't love it and they don't think it's meaningful, then, you know, we know they, they leave it. And maybe now, you know, the great resignation, maybe this is also about people having had the whole pandemic experience and saying, I've really shifted my priorities and some of this has made me think what am I doing with my life? Indeed, what am I doing with my life? These are thoughts that I and possibly you have when we hear about someone who has left their nine to five job and gone on to do something really worthwhile with their lives. And working at LSE, a university alive with energy and ambition, you don't have to cast around too far to find someone who has done exactly that. I'm Nick O'Shea and I run Ignition Brewery, which is a small brewery in South East London. Nick is an LSE economics graduate who's had a pretty successful career as an economist in government and various NGOs. But when the interest rate dropped on his tracker mortgage and his outgoings dropped with it, by living off of his savings, supplemented by some consultancy work, he was able to work full-time on the social enterprise he was setting up, a brewery which employs and trains people with learning disabilities. I met up with Nick at the Ignition Brewery Tap Room on Sydenham High Street in South East London. So your aim here is what exactly? So the aim of Ignition primarily is to make great beer. So that's number one, because if we don't do that, we're sunk. And, and ultimately, we are a c commercial not-for-profit company where we must have a product that people want to buy because people will buy out of pity once, maybe twice, but you need reliable, regular customers. And so that's our number one goal. 
But number two is brewed, sold, bottled, marketed, delivered by people with learning disabilities, paid the London living wage to show that they have the talents and the abilities, which are often obscured and hidden, to make something that actually, A, you really want to buy, B, you want to buy your friends, and C, you can't make yourself. I'm Chris. I work, my job's is like a uh, make beer. Hello everybody, uh, my name's Michaela. I'm from Ignition Brewery Lewisham, working with people with learning disabilities. Nick has been attending Tuesday Club. A weekly disco for people with learning disabilities in South East London, hosted by the charity MenCap for over 20 years. He was troubled that most of the people that came to Tuesday Club did not have jobs. In fact, 94% of people with a learning disability do not. But what to do about it? Nick was on the Camino de Santiago, a pilgrimage that ends at the Shrine of the Apostle James in northwest Spain, when the answer came while drinking beer with nuns. So in 2013, I went on Camino, uh, which is a walk, you will be known to Santiago, and um, on the advice of a nun <laughs> called Sister Els, uh, she said, look, you've got to do something about this, and what are your options? And I was like, well, a brewery or a moisturising company, I think. And she's like, just do the brewery, do the brewery. We're drinking beer, do the brewery. So on her advice, um, decided to do that. And, it, and there was then a very long period of prototyping. We tried selling alcohol in markets to see if people would buy alcohol from our team. And, you know, was that going to work? And then trying to find a brewery space that would let us in. I'd never been to a brewery before that first day. Um, anyway, so then really it was just this idea of craft beer is a thing. It's cool. It's labour intensive, it's repetitive. I think there's a margin. That's the number one thing. I think we can make enough money to pay our bills with it. Um, so yeah, let's do it. <laughs> let's just do it. In, in retrospect, it seems a bit of an odd path, I have to say, but it, it all makes sense at the time. How does working here impact someone's life who's perhaps never had a job before? You know, a lot of people learn to spend their lives being micromanaged. Don't do this, don't touch that, don't put this there, don't put that. But And in the end, it just stops you thinking because you're just waiting for someone to tell you what to do. Actually, it's easier. And I think here where people feel they have autonomy and trust and equity and ownership, we're working a lot on ownership at the moment, uh, is, uh, is, is really important. And I think, I hope that's what it is. And I suppose the metric I would use is we have very low staff absences for any reason. We have, you know, a long line of people who want to come and work here, which is both good and bad, uh, because obviously we're not meeting the demand for employment. Um, and then, you know, I think we have, I have seen people, myself included, grow, but specifically with our team move away from this sense of fear that they're going to be sacked. We have to do a lot of work at the beginning around, you're not going to be fired. This is, you know, this is something where you can feel employed and safe and you have workers' rights, and we're not gonna just sack you because you dropped a bottle or whatever it is. Nick risked a lot, his career prospects and potentially even his house to pursue his commitment to improving people's lives. But where do deep callings to pursue a passion come from? I spoke to Shasa de Brau, assistant professor in the Department of Management at LSE. She explained her interest in researching people's callings. Well, so I have to go back in time to look at how I got into this into this research in the first place. And in addition to being an academic, I also have a, a past as a professional musician. And it was through my, my involvement in the world of music that I became really intrigued by why do people go into such a seemingly crazy career path where their chances of ever making it are so low, yet people go after it with such intense passion and they just keep going and going and going in spite of really being in such a risky potential career path. Shasa has undertaken a longitudinal study of 450 musicians, looking at how their careers unfolded over 20 years. I asked her about her findings. What I found in my research is that callings actually can be developed, they can be discerned, they can be um, cultivated over time. And the main factors I've seen in my research in terms of what factors may help people to cultivate a calling, if that's what they want, 
is first of all, being behaviorally engaged in the domain. So in the example of musicians, doing more musical activities is a key factor to developing a calling in the first place. And the second key factor is, do you like the social factors of being involved in your domain? So specifically for musicians, do you like being around other musicians? Do you feel encouraged by being around other musicians? Um, and that sort of thing. So those are the two key factors. And what I love about those findings is that you can actually have some control over both of those things. You can become more behaviorally, more behaviorally engaged and you can really pay attention to those social factors and how much you like being around the people that are in your same domain. So this is potentially good news for those of us who doubt that we have a passion. Shasa's research shows that involvement with and feeling socially comfortable in a particular world, in this case music, were linked to higher initial levels of people feeling that they had a calling. These are both things that we can cultivate if we are looking to explore and develop a passion. Interestingly though, ability was not what necessarily drove someone's calling to music. We found that the stronger your calling, the greater your perceptions of your own ability, regardless of what your actual abilities are, and then the greater your chances of pursuing this particular profession. Now, the, the, the situation where that becomes a problem is when you're in what we would call a winner-takes-all labor market like music and like many other very competitive labor markets where it's actually very problematic to actually obtain a position working in that domain. So when you've got people that are going for it in professions where it's very hard to, to gain employment, you've got all these people trying to, to get positions and there aren't very many positions and people are, are pursuing it even though they may not have the objective ability to back it up. Hi, I'm interrupting this episode of LSE IQ to let you know where you can find even more amazing LSE content. Our public lectures are free to attend and feature some of the most influential figures in the social sciences. To listen to past events, search LSE Lectures and Events wherever you get your podcasts and visit lse.ac.uk forward slash events to check out our upcoming programme. Now, back to IQ. You're listening to LSE IQ. In this episode, we're asking, should you follow your passion? We've heard about the things we can do to cultivate a passion, but according to Shasa's research, callings might drive someone to pursue a career which they are objectively not skilled enough to succeed at, which, of course, must be ultimately devastating. And there are other downsides to the intense desire to follow a career or passion. Sally Maitlis, Professor of Organisational Behaviour at Oxford University, who we heard from earlier, and her colleague, Kira Shabram, studied some very committed people working in animal shelters. We have some little darlings here waiting for home. Been in a few days. They found that certain individuals were driven by their commitment and love for animals to disillusionment and burnout. Sally described the working conditions. It was true for everybody in the study that they got into the shelters and they found that um, they were difficult working conditions. Physically, emotionally, you had, you know, diff, diff, you had sort of cotton, often managers who didn't quite know what they were doing. You had colleagues a bit like you, but who wound you up for that very reason. You had people who would, you know, go and adopt a dog and then couldn't look after it and would bring it back. And you just had far too many animals to possibly be able to, 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 to make life good for. And as they faced these challenges one after another, they responded to them in, in different ways. But what made some people more prone to burning out in this environment than others? Sally and her co-author found three types of individuals. The first were those who had a sense of themselves as having a unique gift to help animals. Sally explained. When they encountered these challenges, it was almost like a personal affront to their identity. And they felt that they should be able to overcome this because this is what they were really literally born to do. And so they tried harder and harder and they sort of took more and more work in and tried to do everything themselves and felt that nobody else in the shelter could do it as well as they could. And uh, in the end, it, you know, it, it, it overwhelmed them completely. They fought so hard to make it good, they collapsed, essentially. 
The second group felt that they had special skills that could make a difference in the shelter. Like the first group, their idealised expectations of their calling clashed with shelter reality. They didn't quite feel they had these unique gifts, but they did feel that they really wanted to make a contribution to the world and they really cared about animals and this is where they were going to sort of leave their, their positive footprint on the earth. And they also found that as things got in their way, they became very frustrated by them and they, they tried harder and harder to overcome them and persuade other people to do things differently and set up things that could... And, and again, you know, it was all... It, it all became too much. And some of them, the homes were full of animals because they were taking them home because they, you know, they didn't want to youth, do euthanasia, which was, the, you know, the most awful part of the, the thing that they found they were having to do. Only a minority of those who were interviewed for the research managed a more sustainable approach to their work. They didn't see themselves as having a special gift or skill in caring for animals. Instead, they focused on learning, growing and collaborating, which enabled them to take on increasing levels of responsibility. There was this, this other group who also had been very passionate, but a little bit less identified with the work. You could think of it that way. And they really wanted to do it, but they also sort of thought, well, I don't feel uniquely gifted. I don't feel like this is my contribution to the world. I just want to learn to do this work really well. And then I'm going to be able to help these animals and, and everybody else. And it was these people who somehow were able to weather the course because they also faced just as many challenges in the first instance. But they, you know, this is a sort of cliche, you know, that they treated the challenges as opportunities, but they almost did. They almost saw them as opportunities to learn instead of kind of affronts to their, their pursuit of the calling. And over time, they developed very collaborative relationships and they found ways to, to deal with, to overcome and to, 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 to survive uh, and to thrive in their calling. How can you protect yourself from burnout in this particular environment or more generally if you're following your passion? Well, to, to almost to, to begin by, by knowing that you may be rather vulnerable to it. Yeah, and that's not to sort of be a wet blanket and put a downer on your, on your passion, but to say, OK, because I care this much about it, it's going to leave me uh, a little bit open to great disappointment, to great frustration. So that's the piece you can do, the sort of self-care piece you can do to look after yourself. And you can try to come back to that as you're doing the work and getting very frustrated and sort of try and ground yourself and say, well, look, this is, this is what we know now about people like me. This is what happens to us. And I would also really encourage any, any employers who are running, you know, particularly these kind of very purpose-led organisations where you're going to be hiring in wonderful people who really care and who are vulnerable to burnout, look out for them and, and try to give them a realistic job preview when they volunteer or when they come to interview and then try to create a way that they can voice and work on some of their some of the, the the things that they struggle with as well as sort of come to terms with you know reframe what's going to be possible here in the course of the work and feel supported because all these people of course ended up feeling terribly alone and they weren't really alone but this was this was how they ended up feeling Sally's work highlights the gap between expectation and reality and how that can break people who feel an intense dedication to their work as someone who seems to be negotiating this path well, I wondered what Nick wished he had known before he started. I think that it would probably be fine and that the stakes probably weren't as high as I thought. I think because because expectations are so low for people with learning disabilities, when you say you're going to do a brewery, it's seen as like out of this world. Whereas if I just said I'm going to do a brewery, people probably would have gone, oh yeah, that's quite interesting. But because when you talk about who it's going to employ, suddenly it just becomes this big thing and everyone has a view on it and everyone thinks that it's going to fail and and that's really depressing a lot of people that said that to me are mediocre people so i don't need to care what they think and i think i wish i'd um i wish i'd just been a lot more like yeah whatever and maybe not actually explain to as many people why i was doing what i was doing or what actually and just done it a lot more under the radar we've also got a team so it's not just one person it's a team of us and i think that's really the secret of a lot of it is is getting I wish I'd known the importance of a team earlier. I wondered if Nick's success also lay in how he considers his purpose. I think it, I'm going to use a very odd word. Um, I think it was my assignment. So I think that for whatever reason, 
I would put it down to Catholicism, but you know, other people might call it guilt. Uh, the, um, but I, I, I had a strong sense, gutturally, that this was something that needed to happen. And once you start doing it, once you've made the decision to do something, you then find you have to just keep going with it. And I suppose it's that daily commitment in a weird way um, that kept me in it. But I suppose I never really had that thought of, all right, this is my purpose, this is it. But I, I suppose in answer to your question, my passion is local people and people whose talents don't get airplay. Returning to our initial question, should you follow your calling? And does it matter if you don't? For Shasta de Brow, it may depend on how strong that calling is. Some recent research I've been doing using the data from my longitudinal study of musicians, we look at two really important life outcomes. One is income and one is happiness or what we would call um, in a technical sense, subjective well-being. And what we find is that if you have a strong calling, you are best off pursuing music in this case because you end up earning more money and being happier than if you don't pursue calling. However, what's interesting is that if you don't have a very strong calling in the first place and you go pursue something else, you're actually earning the most and the happiest of all. And so I think what's important to recognize is that it's not a given that having a stronger calling leads to better outcomes. It's more once you have a strong calling, then it may be better to go for it, to pursue it. Um, But it's not a given that you must find a calling in the first place and that you then must pursue it. So if anything, when I talk about callings, especially with my students, um, what I try to, to advocate really is that what's important for us is that we all are seeking meaning in life. This is a fundamental human need. And, and many of us are looking for that meaning to come from work, but there are other domains of our lives where we can get that sort of meaning um, from being in our families, from extracurricular activities, from involvement in, in charitable organizations. There are all sorts of things that we do in our lives to, to gain meaning. And so what I try to encourage my students or anyone listening is what's important is to put together a whole life package for yourself where you're getting the meaning you need. Some of that may come from work and some of that may come from outside of work. So having a passion isn't necessarily essential for being happy in life and a strong sense of meaning might not need to come from your job. This is something that Sally Maitlis echoes when I ask her what advice she gives to her students. Well, I'm actually not a big, I'm not a big giver of advice. I'm a big question asker. So if they did, and as they actually have done, you know, I tend to say, well, tell me about this passion. You tell me what it is. Tell me what you love about it. Tell me what you imagine doing with it. What do you want from it? What do you want from your life? You know, to just unpack that a bit, because I think it's so important to do more of this looking inside these these kind of tropes about follow your passion. So what 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 does this really mean for you? And then I would listen to them voicing their you know their love, their fears. I'd listen out for where might this come from? Whose passion is this? Is this anyway? You know. Um, you want to follow it. Do you do you want and do you need to follow it as a, as a career? You know, I have a passion for music. I'm lucky. I've played the cello since I was seven. I played in orchestra. I loved it. It was the thing I most, most loved. And I was so lucky to realise very early on, I'm just not that good. I've always found people to make music with, but I don't aspire to be professional. I never did. The thing I actually hate is doing a solo performance because it brings up all the sort of performance anxiety associated with work. And uh, there it is. It's my passion. I've kept it in this beautiful, um, you know, glass box almost that I take out and I enjoy and I put back. And, and it's not going to get sort of, um, you know, overlaid with all the expectations that come for many of us when we think about doing a good job and having a good career and getting on in our lives. So I would probably share some of that story too, but without wanting to put them off. I mean, yeah, you know what, if you can follow your passion and work on your passion, not burn out, I mean, great. I'm, I'm delighted for you. Now, Sally, non-academic question. Both you and Shasta are musicians. Is this coincidental? <laughs> Probably not, you know, because what they say about academics is, you know, you, you sort of study your unanswered, your own personal unanswered questions. <laughs> so I know Shasta was more of a musician than me. I mean, she actually was professional, semi-professional. Um, so so I, I can see how she was doing that. And for me, um, yeah, I actually did my doctoral dissertation on symphony orchestras. And again, like I did ethnography. I hung out with these people for a long time. I went to their concerts. I went on tour with them. Uh, you know, and that was perfect. 
You found a different way to live the dream. Exactly. Nick, a man who has gone all in on creating a life of meaningful endeavour, emphasises that we can only procrastinate so long when thinking about pursuing a passion. Would I tell someone to follow the passion? I, yeah, yes, is the answer. I mean, I think it's not always clear what your passion is. I think that's a, a really important point. And I think there's, it's really important to clarify what your passion really is and actually what might be things which feel similar but aren't. So, for example, you know, a lot of people want, they think their passion is to be, become a therapist or a counsellor. But actually what they need to do is have therapy or counselling themselves. So there's that element. But then I, I, what I would say to you is my English teacher at school, I went back about two years into the brewery. I think I just quit the job and, you know, it's not looking great, is it? And uh, you're wearing last year's clothes. And um, I just explained to her what I was doing. And she just said, Nicholas, life is not a rehearsal, which, you know, is a very well-known phrase. But actually I was really surprised that someone of her experience and gravitas and all the rest of it said that to me and that was her response there are quite large side effects sometimes to following things that aren't your passion and regret and insecurity can be two of them and i think that's why if you can get your passion even as a side hustle and then it grows over time and then your your other stuff diminishes that's a really good thing to do because there does come a point where it's a bit late that's really interesting that you put it like that because, of course, you know, often we talk about the risk of following your passion, but you're talking about the risk of not following your passion. It's equally important. Because also, I mean, we live, we're very lucky. I mean, for now, we live in a, in a very sort of wealthy country. I don't know where five years' time, but, you know, but we live in a really wealthy country. You can get a job anywhere. You can live, it's, it's easy, especially if you've got a degree from mercy. You know, you can always find a job and, and, and get the basics that you need. And that's a massive opportunity. So therefore, if that's not really that difficult to do, then then it seems to me that then the obvious thing is to then follow, is follow the passion. And, and I do think, yeah, I think you don't want to have regrets at the end. Speaking of having no regrets, Nick has plans to expand into making ice cream this year. If you're in South East London, do head to the Ignition Brewery Tap Room on Sydenham High Street. Should you follow your passion, Undoubtedly, we need driven people to help change the world for the better, to inspire us in the fields of music, dance, sport and more. But if you're not one of these people, don't worry. An all-consuming passion is not the only way to build meaning and fulfilment in your life. This episode was produced by me, Sue Windybank, with support from Anna Bevan, Ollie Johnson and Natalie Abbott. If you'd like to find out more about the research in this episode, head to the show notes. And if you enjoy IQ, please leave us a review. Coming up soon on LSE IQ. The vials had an amount of red liquid in, which represented the amount of eggs that a woman would have in her ovaries. Um, so they had a range of um, perfumes, which were called things. I remember one was called Oh So Pressured, E-A-O, um, which was talking about the, um, the, the ticking biological clock. Next month on LSEIQ, Jess Winterstein will be asking, do we need the arts to change the world?